Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, it says, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. The first description of an inclusive gathering of people from all over the world wasn't really something that I could call an act of worship. If anything, it was an act of defiance. If anything, it was an attempt not to create a religion, not to fulfill a religion, but actually to put themselves instead of God as if they are God. That is the tragic reality that we see today in this world. You know, I'm looking back at the heart of God when it comes to religion. And I can see in the book of Isaiah in chapter 1 how God has always been against what men did from the commandments that he gave them. And he told the people of Israel, look what you have done with the things that I told you to do. Look at your holidays, your festivals, your new moons, your Sabbaths. He says, my soul hates them. He said, how can you do all these things, all these religious activities, all these rituals, and at the same time, your hands are full of blood. And so when we look at the topic of the rise of one world religion, we must go back all the way to the book of Genesis and understand that God created man in his image for a wonderful fellowship with him. And unfortunately, starting from chapter 3, that fellowship was broken. And from now on, man is going to try to get to God. But it's all about how am I going to put myself in the center? And how is it going to be that I will create a system that supposedly will be about God, but in reality, it will be all about the humans. The book of Galatians chapter 1 verse 10 says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You can clearly see that the true faith in God through Christ is not about men. It's not about pleasing men. It's not about putting men in the center. You can clearly see that there is a growing gap between what God wants us to do and what mankind is doing with it. It continues with Proverbs 29, 25, where he says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So we're going to examine today whether we are watching from Jerusalem, from this bustling city, eternal city, a city that you're going to hear a lot of noises and sounds and action going on all behind me. It's a city that is not going to sleep. It's a city that is all about religion. Behind me is one of the most iconic Christian symbols for over a billion people. And it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for the Catholic and the Greek Orthodox. And then you've got the Church of the Redeemer for the Lutherans. There is nothing more religious than this. And yet, we're going to try and understand how in the world can such a clear instruction from God to worship Him in spirit and in truth can evolve into a religious activity that is not about God and that Jesus is not even part of? We're situated on the rooftops of the old city. And uh, by the way, this is more or less the border between the Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter, and the Jewish quarter on the other side. 
right over there in the east, it's the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and it's sitting right on the Temple Mount, right towering over the Western Wall, the holiest site in the world for the Jewish people. And of course, the Temple Mount today is held as the third holiest site in the world for the Muslims. So you're watching a holy site for Christians behind me, a holy site for Jewish over there, and right above it, a holy site for the Muslims. No doubt, a center of religions that is within one square mile. It is phenomenal how we are so talented in creating religions and it's so hard for us to really worship God in the most simple way. One of the things that uh, so many people around the world, I believe, are mistaken about is the fact that they look at Islam today as the possible candidate for the world religion. And the reason is very simple. They see places and they see countries that are seeking to create dominance, such as Iran and maybe organizations or terrorist organizations such as ISIS that wants to create worldwide caliphate. But one thing they forget, they forget that Islam is not calling for all people to worship God as they are. Islam is actually calling for submission by the sword. And it's a different story. It's a different story because that's not what we see in the book of Revelation when it comes to the description of a new and emerging world religion. By the way, that mistake leads people to believe that the Antichrist is also a Muslim because they believe that there is the Muslim Mahdi who is their Messiah and his coming will be as if that's the Antichrist himself. That's another thing that is very unlikely. A, because I don't know even a single Israeli Jew that will look at a Muslim as his Messiah. And B, I don't understand why a Muslim needs to get to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and enter into a Jewish temple to declare himself as God when he has the third holiest site in the world for Islam there. In other words, it has to be something different. It has to be something out of the ordinary, something that the world has not seen before. And it's very interesting because we often look at the existing religions as, as probably candidates for that. But I am offering today a different perspective. I believe that there is an existing religion that is ready to be as a shell for something new that is being injected into it. And I'm talking about the Catholic Church. This is the only one that fits the bill of all the descriptions of the book of Revelation. The Catholics never ever looked at themselves the way we call them Roman Catholics. Catholicism did not start in Rome. It started in Constantinople, in what Istanbul is today. And the word Catholic means universal. It means it belongs to everyone. The Catholic Church today, and for the last at least seven, eight years, maybe more, we see an unbelievable concentrated effort with hundreds of millions of dollars that are being poured into it to reach out to every part of world population in order to bring them all under a new concept of the Catholic Church. A few years ago, there was a conference at the Kenneth Copeland Ministries Center in the United States, and Bishop Tony Palmer, on behalf of Pope Francis, came and offered a crowd of enthusiastic, charismatic Protestant Christians. He came to offer them an offer, and he said to them, Catholic means universal. And if you are Christians, it doesn't matter where you're from, you're Catholic. We know that the first thousand years there was one church, it was called the Catholic Church, and the word Catholic means universal, it doesn't mean Roman. 
Catholic means you, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. <laughs> Come back home. Come back to what everything really should be. Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then he played a video that was sent by Pope Francis. Dear brothers and sisters, excuse me, because I speak in Italian, but I am not speaking English. But uh, I will speak uh, no Italian, no English, but carefully. Yo vi parlo como fratello. E vi parlo così semplicemente. Con joy e nostalgia. Facciamo crescere la nostalgia, perché questo ci spingerà a trovarci, a abbracciarci. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è, è incominciato. He did not even mention Mary even once. Knowing it's a crowd of Protestants that don't believe that Mary is anything divine. And it's quite amazing to see this is probably the first Pope in the history that reached out to the Protestants that way. And it's very interesting because uh, it followed Bishop Kenneth Copeland going to the Vatican saying the Protestant movement has come to an end. No more protest. No more Protestant movement. That's it. Enough is enough. The biggest church split in history, when, when the Catholic Church split, you know the story, the beginning of the protesting church, among the people of love, we're called protesters. We've been protesting for 500 years, baby. October the 31st. 1999, representatives of the Catholic and the Lutheran churches gathered in Augsburg, Germany and signed a joint declaration on the subject of justification. And so 500 years of arguments, misunderstandings, and sometimes wars began to give way to reconciliation and recognition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as placed within the body of Christ. It ended. But you see, once that main separating spirit of division was pulled down. It released the Lord Jesus to get this thing underway. Amen. The protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. To tell people that glory is more important than doctrine is literally leading them astray. The Bible says, Galatians 1 verses 8 to 9, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, in the Greek, anathema. As we have said before, so now I say it again. If you didn't understand, let me tell you again. If anyone preaches 
any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Anathema. The Bible is so clear about that. Romans chapter 16 verse 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. Contrary to the doctrine. Doctrine is important. Don't let anyone teach something that is contrary to the doctrine that you have learned. Stay away from them. Isn't that interesting? Look, the Bible tells us one thing, and somebody on behalf of God, on behalf of religion, on behalf of worshiping God in the most inclusive way, is telling you the opposite. It is not only leading the force in bringing all Christians together, but it's also a leading force in an interfaith ecumenism. So think about it. Islam is not trying to reach the whole world. Judaism is not trying to reach the whole world, but Roman Catholicism is. In 2019, there was a visit of the Pope to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and the Pope and the Grand Imam signed historic pledge of fraternity, and in that historic pledge of fraternity, it says, in the name of God, who has created all humans being equal in rights, duties, and dignity, and who has called them to live together as brothers and sisters, to fill the earth and make known the values of goodness, love, and peace. I don't think I found Jesus there. I don't even think I saw that he is the only way, truth, and life. I don't understand where it says here, that you should be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, all that I just said is the words of Jesus. The assumption that we're all good people and can live in great harmony is basically almost like going back to the Tower of Babel and saying, make a name for ourselves. It's taking God out of the equation or even more so replacing him. Did you know that Peter referred to Rome as Babylon? Did you know that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, she who is in Babylon, that church, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. In those days, Peter, the common language of the people then, because Peter has never been to Babylon himself, he's been to Rome. But after what Rome did to Jerusalem and to the Jewish people, in, in a Jewish lingo, it was called Babylon. In November 21, 1964, in the Second Vatican Council, look what he said. He says, the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, in the first place among whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge, on the last day. I mean, I'm not making it up. This is a Second Vatican Council from 1964 that is already saying, we do not reject anything in the others. We accept all of them, even though they're different. But if they want to come to their fullness of their religious life, then it's only through Christ. In 1965, they continued and said, Over the centuries, many quarrels and dissensions have arisen between Christians and Muslims. Look what he said. The sacred council now pleads with all to forget the past and urges that a sincere effort be made to achieve mutual understanding for the benefit of all men. Let them together preserve and promote peace, liberty, social justice, and moral values. That's what it's all about. Social justice, moral values, peace, and liberty. There is no more exclusivity of salvation through Christ alone. Pope Francis in 2013, in a Wednesday on May 22nd, said the following thing. 
the idea that we cannot all do good is a form of closeness, a barrier. The Pope emphasized that that leads us to war and to killing in God's name. Now look what he says. We cannot kill in God's name. Indeed, even saying that one can kill in God's name is blasphemy. And he says, you must be doing good things. The Lord redeemed everyone with Christ's blood. Everyone, not only Catholics, he says, everyone. He is now broadering everything. And then he says, an atheist, they too. That with, you don't even have to believe in God in order to be redeemed. All you need to do is good. Be a good man. Do good things. And that's it. You'll be redeemed. Because His blood makes us all children of God. That's it. In other words, if you are Roman Catholic, it's great. But if you are not, it doesn't really matter. Be a good man. Do good. Don't kill in the name of religion. Be a good person. And if you are a good person, everything is good. The bridges are already there. It's already been communicated to them. Hey, just so you know, before things go rough, if anything happens to Islam, if you may lose your way in your religion, you have a place in ours. Because all we seek is that you be a good people. You don't really have to convert to anything. You don't have to adopt any new thing. Just stay good, be good, do good, and you're with us. In the ancient times, to spread a new religion, it was by the power of the sword. That was the way. This emerging new world religion is not by the sword, it's with honey. It's with good words, with sweet words, with, with inclusivity, with we are accepting everyone. It's the love and social justice that will put us together. And it doesn't matter. There are some differences. Yes, maybe theological differences. Maybe only if you believe in Jesus, you'll come to the fullness of your religious life. But as you are right now, it's good enough to already be redeemed. Wow. There is a united religious initiative of the United Nations. And they say the United Religious Initiative, the URI, is a global grassroots interfaith network that cultivates peace and justice by engaging people to bridge religious and cultural differences and work together for the good of their communities and the world. You know, natural disasters and catastrophes lead to religion. Every time something bad happens, people are flocking to churches and they're seeking God because they understand, you know, this is beyond our control. And it's interesting how even that is being tackled. On January 31st, 2021, it says Biden and Pope Francis could make a climate change miracle. You see, it's no longer about the Bible. It's no longer about the gospel. It's no longer about Jesus. It's about climate change now. And speaking of global authority and climate change, Pope Francis actually called for a global government to tackle the climate change agenda. In fact, uh, Pope Francis declares climate emergency and urges action. Look, I mean, I don't remember any, anything like that before, where the church is doing everything but church. What is more amazing way to bring the whole world together than climate change? Think about it. Terrorism failed because terrorism brought countries together. You know, after the uh, Twin Towers fell, uh, it was President Bush that came to the rubble and, and how was he accepted? USA, USA, it's the US flag. Everybody rounded around the flag of the United States. It didn't really help bringing the world together. It brought the Americans together. So if terrorism is not working and wars are not working, 
then what else can we choose to bring the whole world under one government if not something that affects the whole world at the same time in the same way? And of course, climate change is the one and the Pope is not missing an opportunity to be a leading force in all of these things. Look what he says in 2019, future generations stands to inherit a greatly spoiled world. Our children and grandchildren should not have to pay the cost of our generation's irresponsibility. Indeed, as is becoming increasingly clear, young people are calling for a change. Make no mistake, I have no problem with taking care of planet Earth. I'm trying to show that the Catholic Church emptied itself from the doctrine and is filling itself with everything else. coming to another point which is going to shock you closing the gap with science and darwinism are you ready for this in 2014 october 28 pope francis is visiting a scientific center and he says evolution and big bang theories are real now i'm talking about someone who supposedly preaches on a sunday that god created the world in six days and yet look what he says the beginning of the world is not the work of chaos that owes its origin to something else, but it derives directly from a supreme principle that creates out of love. The Big Bang that today is considered to be the origin of the world does not contradict the creative intervention of God. On the contrary, it requires it. Evolution in nature is not in contrast with the notion of divine creation because evolution requires the creation of the beings that evolve. That God is not a magician with a magic wand. He did not create things like that. Things had to evolve. The Big Bang had to have happened. The funny thing is that scientifically, the Big Bang theory has not been proven yet. What is the work of creation? The work of creation is to create something out of nothing. And the Big Bang Theory doesn't have any explanation to that. No, there was a God that created this world in six days and that's what the Bible says. And if you have a problem with that, then you have a problem with God and His Word. You don't have a problem with me, you have a problem with the same God you claim to represent. Now that's a very interesting thing you would probably not expect from it the Catholic Church is on 2020, October 21st, 2020, last year, Pope Francis indicates support for same-sex civil unions. The BBC uh, recorded homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. You can't kick someone out of a family nor make their life miserable for this. What we have to have is a civil union law. That way we are legally covered. Now, make no mistake. I am not trying to say that one person is less than another person. What I'm trying to say is the church traditionally was holding an opinion that it is a sinful lifestyle that should be condemned. Yet here we see that for the first time, he's the first Pope, by the way, that is saying that. Actually, we should support civil union and make it actually in a law. Collaboration with the efforts to create the one world government we can see in September 25th of last year, nationalism must not prevail, Pope said, in addressing the United Nations. Basically, Pope is saying, hey, nations and nationalism is the thing of the past. Leaders should not take care of their own nations anymore. Nationalism 
must not prevail. We must look at things from a global perspective. In fact, he said in a meeting with world leaders in 2019, the common good has become global. Look at the terminology he's using, has become global. We are getting there. We are becoming that. It is going there. He's basically stating a fact. What was is no longer. What is right now is new and I am ready to be part or to take some sort of leadership in this new thing. The current situation of globalization, not only of the economy, but also the technological and cultural exchanges, the nation state is no longer able to procure the common good of its population alone. Look what he's saying, your government is not good. The nation state is something of the past. It cannot take care of problems anymore. The common good has become global and nations must associate for their own benefit. If you want to benefit, you must associate in the global effort. So what is a one world religion? A one world religion is when the entire world will reach a point where they worship the same way the wrong thing. Revelation 17 verses 1 to 6, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. Look at those strong words the Bible is using about that religion. Who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. It's not purity. It's not the word of God. It's not righteousness. It is fornication. Leaders of the world will be part of that. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, people will not be able to think right. Drunkenness is when you are unable to control yourself anymore. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold. Look, these are the colors that are being used in the Vatican today. And you know, talking about seven hills, Rome is known as the city sits on the seven hills. And look what he says, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. You see, the Bible is describing a world religious system that is full of abomination and fornication. It has nothing to do with God. Religion of inclusion, with the exception of those who follow Jesus. This is a description of the Great Tribulation. Our natural inclination is to be accepted and loved, but, but what does the Bible say about that? Matthew 10, 22 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. In other words, you will never be accepted. You'll never be the world religion. You'll never be embraced by the entire universe. You'll be hated. If you are true believers, if you believe in me, the Bible says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hates me before it hates you. In James 4, 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. John 3 19 and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil with Jesus they hate you without Jesus they accept you in other words Jesus is saying hey you will have to come to the end of yourself in order to accept me it's not about you anymore it's about what I did for you it's the message of the cross is foolishness to the world because the world, the world wants to earn its salvation. There is no way you can earn your salvation. 
The wages of sin is death. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome this world.